I always found England stifling. And so I came at age 22 in 1976 to Vancouver. The next summer in 1977, I decided I wanted to go and sort of sit on a beach somewhere and ended up in the West End at English Bay. I didn't know that I had landed in the heart of the West End uh, where the gay community was thriving. All these wonderful, wonderful guys that just uh, brought me into their lives. It was fun and it was safe being with them and I kind of grew up a lot in those years, in those sort of late 70s, early 80s. But the first time I became aware of HIV was um, in my friend's apartment. This is my friend Robert, and we'd known each other for, well, I guess, 12 years by then, and we were very close. And he told me that he'd been diagnosed with this thing that uh, was called HIV. He seemed to be scared. What do you say in those circumstances? It was a moment of truth, I guess. Don and Robert, they had been a couple for many years and, and then they separated. They both got it. These were the, my two really closest friends. And then they were all of a sudden not going to be in my life anymore. Don and Robert died within actually two weeks of each other. I remember Don, who was this tiny little thing anyway, um, and he was in this special bed because he was so frail. He asked me to lie down with him on the bed, and I was terrified that I was going to break a bone or something, so I sort of gingerly laid down on this thing and we, we sort of swung together on this bed together, and that's the last time I saw him. That was, I think, 1990, and I started to meditate and uh, and sort of do things that go on retreats and do things like that to figure things out for myself and I met my uh, love of my life soon to be um, husband uh, in 1992 so fairly soon actually after these two really important men in my life died um, maybe they made space for my husband Richard to show up in my life Well, after I met Richard, I was always living on the west side, and a succession of moves took me east in Vancouver with him. And finally, we ended up in Strathcona, which is part of the downtown east side, and we bought a house there in 1995. As things turned out, it's a very long story, I became the president of the Strathcona Residents Association. Mostly what the conversations in Strathcona, in the community, were about safety and break-ins and trying to protect themselves. Their answer to that was, you know, we need more police and we need more enforcement to protect us. And that just didn't sit right with me at all. And I read this magazine article by Gore Vidal talking about uh, how people's rights in the U.S. and in North America were being taken away under the guise of, well, there's an emergency situation. We have a war on terror and we have a war on drugs. And I read all that, and he talked about this thing called harm reduction that um, was becoming popular in Europe. Exactly the same time, there had been a meeting in Oppenheimer Park uh, in a big tent, and all the community folks had brought over some guys from Frankfurt to talk about their harm reduction measures there. And it was like this sort of, this light sort of went on. The harm reduction helped the people and it helped the communities that they were living in. And so as the president of the association, I. Uh, called a meeting and I invited people to talk about it. What I thought was just going to be a slam dunk and everybody would say, great, let's support it, was the opposite. A few people thought it was okay, but most people were scared of it. And, it, and I realized the level of fear that ordinary people have about marginalized people. That was a very good lesson for me. And also to understand the level uh, that what fear does to people, how it colors their thinking and closes their hearts. Well, after that experience in my community, I decided that I needed a bigger pond. So I found this community health committee that was a part of the a structure of the Vancouver Richmond Health Board at the time. I met Bud Osborne, who was the founding member of VANDU, the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. And it was a great thing that Bud actually was on that health board because he pressured them uh, shamed them, guilted them into declaring a public health emergency um, about the HIV epidemic in the downtown east side. 
in those years of 96 to really 2002 or something, but in those late years of the 90s, it was a desperate situation in the downtown east side and anybody going there would be uh, horrified um, and it was really painful living that close to it. So there were absolutely no resources for people who were marginalized, who used drugs, and uh, there, there was needle exchange. The way it was done was uh, not effective and it simply didn't work. So even though we had needle exchange, we got an epidemic through people sharing needles all the time. And finally, the health by that time, it was called Vancouver Coastal, got it and they changed it and they decentralized everything, which made a huge difference. Uh, one day I just got a call from somebody from Victoria uh, inviting me to join the Vancouver Police Board. And it was at the time when there was a lot of conversation. Um, Donald McPherson, he had written the Four Pillars uh, approach to addiction. At the time, um, Mayor Owen was brilliant and he said, look, you're the community person, you can say what I can't say yet because I'm, I'll get killed by Ottawa and Victoria and I, I can't say this yet, but you can, so you can talk about supervised injection and I'll do what I can do from behind the scenes. And so that was basically what we did. And the thing about harm reduction is meeting people where they're at. Well, it's the same with the police. And, you know, I sort of went on and, and the police isn't some big amorphous thing. It's a group of people and there are some great people and there are some uneducated people and then there's some stubborn people. I mean, it's just like life. Marginalized people who are injecting drugs in the back alleys of any city are not in the system. And so this was an amazing um, idea because it actually brought them inside to meet people in the health system who were friendly and wanting to assist them and be there for them. And honestly, for many people coming in to inject an insight, it was maybe the first time somebody knew their name, even if it was a made-up name. All of a sudden, because of um, um, contracting HIV through sharing needles, uh, they were in the system uh, with HIV, developing into AIDS, and they were a burden on the system, uh, and they had to be taken care of. You couldn't just ignore them, as they had previously been ignored before. And so that really helped, <laughs> in a weird kind of way, us get support for them, um, where it hadn't existed before. So HIV actually kind of catalyzed um, and supported the harm reduction movement in Vancouver, and I think all over the world. I was approached by this group of people uh, to join this um, group called Keeping the Door Open. They had originally started, formed in uh, about 1999 or 2000, recognizing that harm reduction was really misunderstood and resisted by people that worked inside health. A few people really recognized that, were smart enough and brilliant enough and strategic enough to recognize that. And one of them was Irene Goldstone, who was with the BC Center for Excellence. Warren O'Brien uh, was um, at AIDS Vancouver and Maxine Davis uh, with the Dr. Peter Center. The three of them were the founding members of Keeping the Door Open. They knew the value of public education to change things. It was part of educating the um, Vancouver public. And, and it was part of those people supporting Larry Campbell. And when he said, I want to open the supervised injection site, they knew what that meant and they knew why it was important. And I think keep, Keeping the Door Open had an integral part in making that happen. That always impressed me that AIDS Vancouver had um, uh, grown with the um, population as the population changed. One of the reasons they demonstrated doing that, or one of the ways they demonstrated doing that, they supported keeping the door open uh, in many ways, and they were our home. So after I've been on the board for a while, I um, really noticed that there was a lot of dysfunction within the agency and then other agencies around. And 
I started to talk to people that I knew and trusted uh, to kind of try and understand what that was about. The best um, explanation that I came to was that uh, a lot of the people who have been around for years that were still working in the agency at the time uh, and in the, in the AIDS world in Vancouver had been through severe trauma and the 90s were brutal and not only just people dying and not knowing how to help them but just the the, the whole way people were um, that the rest of the world was relating or not to people who had AIDS was a painful painful story and I think that really does affect the work because people get very emotional emotional about things very easily more than they really need to be about decision making um, they get upset with each other uh, you, know, you don't understand what I'm trying to do, you don't understand me, that kind of thing. I think a lot of them have what I would consider to be post-traumatic stress, and they really have unresolved trauma that, uh, that exists today. The biggest lesson to learn from that is to support staff. It's like, you know, when you're in the plane and they always tell you about the safety things and they say, you know, put on your oxygen mask first and then help everybody else. That's the thing that people working in those kinds of high pressure situations need to do is to take care of themselves. The situation with HIV, it shouldn't be like it is today. We should have figured it out by now. We have wonderful people doing that on, with no resources. Downtown East Side, it's not hard to figure out that people are poor and they need housing and they need someone to love them and take care of them. And there aren't that many of them, but we just don't do that. We give them a little bit here and a little bit there and then, and then go, well, look, we did that. So why isn't it working? Well, it's not enough.